Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to present to you the new clinical practice guidelines for the management of pain, agitation, and delirium in the ICU. This group uh, that you see listed here has worked for more than six years, led by Dr. Julie Barr from Stanford University, to revise the last guidelines that were published in 2002. And these guidelines were created using the GRADE methodology. And if you're not familiar with GRADE, it's a very transparent process that's increasingly being used to develop statements and recommendations. And it allows the developers to develop both the strength of recommendations and report those, as well as to describe the strength of the evidence and the relative risks and benefits of the recommendations. For this effort, we used a professional librarian and uh, eventually dealt with more than 18,000 references. Each of the members of the task force voted online anonymously and recused themselves if there was a conflict of interest. And the result was a much larger effort than was seen in the 2002 guidelines, including 53 statements and recommendations. And by comparison, there were only 28 in the 2002 guidelines and only 36 in the 2008 sepsis guidelines. The task force broke up into four subgroups, each dealing with pain, agitation, delirium, and outcomes. And each of these four groups developed questions using the PICO format, Population, Intervention, Comparison, and Outcome. Now, some of these questions were similar, but not exactly the same, and came up with slightly different answers, which might, on the surface, appear to conflict with each other. But if you understand the question and how they differed, it makes a little bit more sense. And as we get to those uh, specific recommendations, I will try to point those out to you. The first area that we addressed was the pain part of pain, agitation, and delirium. And the recommendation that we made is that all patients should be routinely monitored for pain. Now, this was a plus recommendation, meaning we are recommending in favor of pain monitoring. Plus one is a strong recommendation. And B was a, the uh, level of evidence was intermediate. The most recommended way to monitor pain is using the numeric rating scale, or the NRS. And as you can see on this graph, there are different ways to portray this 0 to 10 graphic. The bottom line is 0 is no pain, 10 is the worst pain imaginable, and having the patient report their pain is by far the preferred approach. Even intubated patients or those who are lightly sedated can usually define their own level of pain. If they're too sedated to do so, we would recommend that you lighten their sedation and allow them to make their own report. Now, there will always be some patients who cannot report their own level of pain. And for that group of patients, there are two scales that we recommend as being the most valid and reliable uh, pain assessment tools based on patient behavior the Behavioral Pain Scale, or the BPS, and the Critical Care Pain Observation Tool, or the CPOT. In addition, we do not suggest that vital sign abnormalities, primarily hypertension and tachycardia, be used as a surrogate for pain, but rather recognize that not all patients with hypertension and tachycardia are having pain, and use the presence of those abnormal vital signs to prompt you to do a pain assessment. This is the BPS, or the Behavioral Pain Scale, and as you can see, it looks at three main criteria, facial expression, upper limb position, and compliance with ventilation. 
Each of these three areas will be assessed and scored between 1 and 4. So the lowest score possible is 3, associated with the least pain, and 12, associated with the most pain. Very similar is the CPOT, and you can see that it looks at four different criteria. Facial expression, body movements, muscle tension, and then either compliance with the ventilator for intubated patients or ability to vocalize for extubated patients. Each of these four areas are scored between 0 and 2, so that the lowest score possible is 0, and the highest score is 8, associated with the most pain. Now, the benefits of doing pain assessment on patients was shown by Payen in this study. And looking at hundreds of patients in the ICU, what they found is that on day two, if the level of pain was assessed, so this yes answer does not mean that yes, the patient was having pain. It means that yes, the presence or absence of pain was documented. That intervention by itself was associated with a slightly lower ICU mortality, but a definitely lower ICU length of stay at 13 days and mechanical ventilation duration at eight days. In addition, knowing whether the patient had pain or not was associated with a lower incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia. Now, how might knowing whether pain was present or absent translate into these benefits? We think most likely it's because if you know the patient is having pain, you can treat it appropriately. More importantly, if you know they're not having pain, but there's some other cause for their hypertension or tachycardia, then perhaps you're treating with a more appropriate drug. In addition, having the patient awake enough to report whether they're having pain or not by itself may translate into outcome benefits. When it comes to treating pain, we recommend that IV opioids be considered the first-line drug. Now, we do not identify a specific IV opioid, but rather feel that they are relatively equivalent and leave up to you as the bedside clinician to select among the many drugs available best matching up with your patient. For instance, if they're hemodynamically unstable or have renal dysfunction or other organ dysfunction, uh, have QTC prolongation, each of these may steer you toward or away a specific opioid. In addition, we recommend that non-opioid uh, medications like gabapentin or carbamazepine may be valuable and beneficial with neuropathic types of pain, and that other non-opioid analgesics like acetaminophen, non-steroidal agents, or ketamine may reduce the dose or the need for IV opioids. The next area that the task force dealt with is the issue of agitation. And we are recommending that the RAS and the SAS are the most valid and reliable sedation assessment tools for measuring the depth of sedation or agitation in adult ICU patients. We do not recommend the routine use of EEG or other brain function monitors such as the BIS or the Narcotrend or the PSI routinely in ICU patients, especially if they are not comatose and not paralyzed, primarily because these monitors are not adequate substitutes when compared to the sedation scoring systems mentioned above, the RAS and the SAS. However, we feel that for patients who are receiving neuromuscular blocking drugs, one of these EEG-based monitors should be used in the ICU. This received a plus 2B recommendation, plus meaning in favor of, 2 being a moderate strength recommendation, and B reflecting the level of evidence.
This is the sedation agitation scale. You can see that it's a seven level scale where a patient who is calm and cooperative is in the middle. And then there are three increasing levels of agitation and three decreasing levels of sedation. This is the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale, or the RAS, and as you can see, it has 10 different levels with alert and calm at zero, and then four increasing levels of agitation, and five decreasing levels of sedation. Now, in this slide, we show the many different uh, pictures of EEG-based monitoring tools. You can see the biz at the top, the sed line in the middle, the narco trend, entropy, and there are others available. Of these, the biz has been the most studied, and we are going to use it as an example, not because it's necessarily better than the others, but just that it is widely available and has been heavily studied. The way that the biz was developed was to take the raw EEG and perform something called fast Fourier transformation then apply power spectral analysis and bispectral analysis, which is an assessment tool specific to the biz. That ends up with a numeric value between 0 and 100, where 0 is an isoelectric EEG and 100 is a patient who is wide awake. Other monitors have followed similar but not exactly the same pathways. And this is important because you can't interchange numbers between monitors. In other words, uh, a patient who is at a clinical status with a level of 60 on the PSI would not be at 60 if monitored with the biz. So you can't interchange numbers between machines. If you're titrating to a specific endpoint with biz, you use the biz and titrate to that number. If you change to a different monitor, you have to go to whatever specific number that monitor's literature directs you to. This is the theoretical relationship between the subjective assessment tools, in this case the SAS, and the EEG-based assessment tools, in this case the biz. And many people think that as you have an agitated patient in yellow, an awake patient in green, and a sedated patient in red, that there's a linear relationship between these. But in fact, if you look at patient-specific data, this is not the case. This graph looks at actual patient data. And you can see if you start in the middle, a patient with a SAS of 4 who is awake and calm and has a BIS of 95, if that patient gets increasingly agitated, their SAS score will go up to 5, 6, and 7. But note that their BIS cannot go any higher. It is limited to 100. So in this situation, we have an increasing SAS value with worsening agitation with a BIS value that does not change. And in this situation, the EEG monitor is failing. If you look at patients that are again awake with a SAS of 4 and a BIS of 95 and give them sedation, they will become increasingly sedated. Their SAS will drop to 3 and their BIS to 83. And you could imagine that their SAS might drop to 2 and their BIS down to 70. And over this range, there likely is a fairly linear agreement between the SAS and the BIS and that they're both changing deeper with more sedation. If you then look at a patient who is very sedated, very deeply sedated, has a SAS of 1, the BIS that may correspond to that might be in the 50 to 60 range. And if you provide deeper sedation, give more propofol, more midazolam, more lorazepam, the SAS cannot go any lower than 1. It is already at the lowest value possible. And yet the BIS will go down, in this case, to 4634. So we have a situation now where the subjective scores are failing. They're not changing, even though the patient is truly getting more deeply sedated and their BIS is dropping. So these types of assessment tools are not linear in their relationship.
Regarding providing sedation, picking medications for sedation, we recommend using an analgesia-first approach, where before sedatives are administered to the patient, opiates or other analgesic medications are provided. We also recommend light levels of sedation because they have been associated with improved clinical outcomes such as shorter mechanical ventilation and shorter ICU length of stay. And we have a very strong recommendation, a plus one level recommendation, that sedation be titrated to a light rather than a deep level of sedation in ICU patients. In addition, we recommend that either these medications be titrated to a consistent light target level of sedation, or if not, that a daily sedation interruption be performed. Now, analgesia first was recommended in the 2002 guidelines, but there was no data supporting this claim. Since then, we have had many studies that have been performed and identified the benefits of providing analgesia first when compared to sedation first. This was one of the earliest studies to do so. Breen and colleagues randomized 105 patients to either get remifentanil and then only get midazolam if the patients were not at the target level of sedation, which in this study was a sedation agitation scale score of three to four, or the patients were randomized to receive midazolam first, titrated to that same SAS score endpoint, and then receive fentanyl or morphine as needed to keep them at the proper pain intensity score. What they found was that the analgesia first group was off the ventilator 54 hours faster, which was statistically significant. And if you looked at the time from the start of ventilator weaning to extubation, that was shorter by 27 hours. In addition, 26% of the analgesia first patients never required and never received midazolam because just by providing the analgesia, they were comfortable and at target level of sedation. In addition, when the patients did receive midazolam, they received much smaller doses of morphine and fentanyl. If you look at the RAS score, the similar range for a lightly sedated patient would be between zero and minus two. Now, RAS of minus three has been a somewhat controversial level. Remember, the definition of that is a patient who will open their eyes but not make eye contact. And when that has been studied, we've learned that a significant number of those patients do not meet usual criteria of being awake. So some patients with a RAS of minus three may be awake, but we generally consider light sedation, a RAS of zero, minus one, or minus two. This is a study in which patients with a RAS of minus three were tested, and you can see that 24% of them, with a confidence interval ranging as high as 38%, were not awake. This is one of the first studies that compared the effect of a lighter level of sedation on ICU patients. It was published in 1999 by Brooke et al. What they did was randomize patients to their existing standard of care, in which patients had no adjustment in the level of medication or titration of that medication. The physician simply said, midazolam five milligrams, and it was kept at that level until the dose was reordered by the physician. Or patients were randomized to a protocol that allowed titration of the medication. Patients could be more lightly sedated or, if needed, more deeply sedated. What they found is that around 40% of patients in both groups ended up on continuous infusion sedation, but in the group that was allowed to have titration as part of the protocol, they were only uh, receiving continuous infusion sedation for about three and a half days, compared to 5.6 days in their standard care group.
The titration protocol group also came off the ventilator about half as long, uh, 55 hours compared to 117, left the ICU about two days faster, 5.7 versus 7.5, and left the hospital uh, almost six days faster. In addition, they had half the rate of tracheostomy at 6% compared to 13% in the routine care group. So the Brook group showed that lighter sedation is associated with better outcomes. J.P. Kress and his colleagues from the University of Chicago showed very similar results a year later when they tested their daily wake-up or daily sedation interruption protocol compared to their standard of care. Again, they showed that the duration of mechanical ventilation was shorter, the median ICU length of stay was shorter, and the need for diagnostic testing to answer the question, why won't my patient wake up? Things like EEGs and CAT scans and neurology consultations was one-third the rate in the daily wake-up group. If you look at what percent of total ICU days patients were awake even for a few minutes while receiving sedation, it was 86% of the days in the daily wake-up group compared to only 9% in the standard of care group. What that means is that in 91% of the ICU days in standard care, these patients were comatose. And this is important because what you are doing with your patients now, whether you're keeping them comatose or titrating them to lighter sedation, will affect the benefits of doing daily sedation interruption. So again, Crest showed that lighter sedation was associated with better outcomes. This screen is taken from the ABC study where patients were randomized to either have a spontaneous breathing trial without a link to the level of sedation or to have a synchronized sedation interruption and spontaneous breathing trial. And this was published by Tim Girard and his group in Lancet in 2008. What they found was that the patients who had linked spontaneous breathing and spontaneous awakening trials had a much uh, shorter period of time in the ICU, nine days compared to 13 days, less time in the hospital, about 15 days compared to 19 days, and had more ventilator-free days, in other words, a higher number of days when they were alive and off the ventilator. If you look at the duration of coma, again, as we talked about in the Crest group where 91% of the ICU days in standard care patients were comatose, note that the duration of coma was three days, but that the 75% confidence interval was seven days. This meant that in the control group, 25% of the patients spent more than seven days comatose. Again, if you are keeping your patients comatose, efforts to lighten their sedation, either with daily sedation interruption or a synchronized spontaneous breathing trial with spontaneous awakening, may be beneficial to your patients. This next study was published by Tregieri in 2009, and they randomized 129 patients to two different levels of sedation, what they called light, which was a modified Ramsey 1 or 2 score, or deep, a modified Ramsey 3 or 4. Both groups were treated with morphine for analgesia and midazolam for sedation. The difference in drug doses was quite striking. This looks at the first seven days of study, days one through seven. The green lines show the patients who were randomized to light sedation, the red lines to the patients who were randomized to deep sedation. The dotted lines reflect their morphine doses, and the solid lines with triangles reflect midazolam doses.
If you look at day one, you can see that the doses of drugs are fairly similar in both groups. And if you look at the lightly sedated group in green, you can see that the doses of morphine and midazolam stay relatively constant during the entire first week. But note what happens to the deeply sedated patients. Their doses of both morphine and midazolam go consistently up such that by the end of the first week, their midazolam doses are in excess of 90 milligrams a day and their morphine doses are in excess of 110 milligrams a day. So this tells us that to keep patients deeply sedated requires more and more and more medication, which probably isn't a great thing. If we look at the outcomes for these patients, at the time patients were leaving the ICU, those randomized to deep sedation spent five and a half days on the ventilator compared to 2.9 in the light sedation group. They were in the ICU five, about a day and a half longer and had a fourfold greater incidence of depression. When these patients were followed up a month after discharge, 6% of the deeply sedated patients could not even complete a simple questionnaire. None of the patients in the light sedation group had that problem. In addition, the deeply sedated patients had higher PTSD scores, had a great deal of difficulty remembering even being in the ICU at 37%, compared to only 14% of the lightly sedated patients. And when they did remember being in the ICU, the memories were disturbing in 18% of the deeply sedated patients, compared to only 4% of the lightly sedated patients. So again, making a strong case that lighter sedation is associated with better outcome. This last study that we'll present is called the SLEEP study, but it didn't really have anything to do with sleep. What it had to do with is comparing the protocol titration sedation approach used by Brooke with the daily sedation interruption approach used by Cress. About 430 patients were randomized to either just protocol titration to a light level of sedation, a SAS of 3 to 4 or a RAS of minus 3 to 0 or to have daily sedation interruption performed on top of that. During the daily sedation interruption, the nurses resumed their sedative infusions at half the previous dose, just as the Crest group had done. And the bottom line was that there was no difference between the two arms regarding time to extubation, which was about seven days in both arms, ICU length of stay, which was about 10 days in both arms, or hospital length of stay, which was 20 days in both arms. But the group that was randomized to daily sedation interruption required significantly larger doses of midazolam and fentanyl and more daily benzo boluses and opiate boluses, primarily because after the daily sedation interruption, nurses had to give more drug to get those patients back into their target level of sedation. So the bottom line was that if you're titrating patients to light sedation, the addition of daily sedation interruption adds no benefit, but does increase nursing workload and drug requirements. This study was recently published and was uh, conducted by the ANZICS group from Australia, New Zealand. And what they wanted to do is to look at with their standard of care, how they were sedating their patients, did it make a difference what happened in the first 48 hours? This is a very um, uncertain time frame that has not been well studied in most of the other sedation studies. And what they found is that if you were deeply sedated with this blue dotted line, you had a lower survival than if you never were deeply sedated in those first 24 to 48 hours. So this helps us understand that even very early and for a brief time in the ICU, deep sedation can appear to have adverse events.
Now these outcomes were adjusted for age and severity of illness and whether the patients had sepsis or not. So as best we can correct for those kinds of things, it appears that coma and deep sedation are not good things for patients. This is a very similar study that was done in Malaysia, again looking at that first 48 hours, showing an even more significant survival deficit in patients who were deeply sedated in the first two days. When it comes to picking our drugs for sedation, if we've already done analgesia first and we're going to try to titrate to light sedation whenever possible, we have a choice of medications. And the guidelines group is recommending that non-benzodiazepines, primarily propofol or dexmedetomidine, be used rather than midazolam or lorazepam. This is a plus two, in other words, a, a recommendation for this intervention with a moderate strength, and the level of evidence was B, which is intermediate. I'd like to now move into the area of delirium. Since the 2002 guidelines, we've learned a lot about delirium, and we know that it is associated with an increased mortality with a level of evidence of A, prolonged ICU and hospital lengths of stay, also level of evidence A, and it is associated with post-ICU cognitive impairment. For monitoring delirium in ICU patients, we recommend using either the CAM ICU or the intensive care delirium screening checklist. In addition, we now understand that coma appears to be an independent risk factor for delirium, and again, this may be drug-induced coma. We think that benzodiazepines may be a risk factor for delirium with level B evidence, and there is not enough data to really define the relationship between propofol and delirium. Now this is the intensive care unit delirium screening checklist. You can see that there are eight items, altered level of consciousness, inattention, disorientation, hallucinations, delusions, or psychosis, agitation or psychomotor retardation, inappropriate speech or mood, sleep-wake cycle disturbances, and symptom fluctuation. During each nursing, nursing shift, the presence or absence of each of these eight factors is defined. If it's present, you get a point. If it's absent, you don't. They don't need to be present at the same time. And you can see in this example, this patient had altered level of consciousness, inattention, agitation, and symptom fluctuation. With four things abnormal, that meets the criteria for delirium. If you have four or more of these factors present, that's delirium. Now if you have one, two, or three of these present, that doesn't meet full-blown delirium criteria, but it's not normal either. And so this gets defined as subsyndromal delirium. And if you look at what this subsyndromal delirium group looks like. You can see that if you look at ICU mortality at 10.6%, they fall in between the normal patients at 2.4% and the full-blown delirium group at 15.9%. And as you look at ICU and hospital length of stay and severity of illness, there are similar trends. So this subsyndromal group, although not full-blown delirium, is a sicker group who likely warrant attention. This is the CAM ICU, and as you can see, there are four features. To be considered delirious with the CAM ICU, you need to have features one, acute onset of mental status changes or fluctuations in the course of their mental status, and inattention. If you have only feature one without feature two or only feature two without feature one, you cannot have delirium and you don't need to do any more testing. But if you have both, then you need to assess with feature three, is their thinking disorganized? This can be assessed by asking them a series of questions and asking them to follow specific commands. Or 
if their level of consciousness is anything but awake and calm, a RAS of zero or a SAS of four, then they could be considered delirium based on that criteria. One thing to note with the CAM-ICU, the similarity of features one and four. And there are some people who feel that perhaps because of this, sedation may be an especially likely confounder. And there is some data to suggest that if you assess patients before they are fully awake, they may be positive on the CAM-ICU more because of sedation than because of delirium. This is something that we're still learning more about, but I think to summarize, we should try to have our patients be as awake as possible in performing the CAM-ICU, certainly at least a RAS of minus two or higher. When it comes to patients uh, and their sedatives and the incidence of delirium, there is consistent data from several studies suggesting that dexmedetomidine may be associated with a lower prevalence of delirium when compared to benzodiazepines. Now, the group made no recommendation regarding prevention of delirium, whether that was uh, dexmedetomidine or any other pharmacologic or non-pharmacologic delirium preventive approach. When we say no recommendation, we don't mean don't do it. We mean we don't know. We don't have data to either recommend for it or against it. There have been very few preventive studies. The group did not recommend the use of haloperidol or atypical antipsychotics be used, again, to prevent delirium. But there is data suggesting that early mobilization may be appropriate when uh, performed and may be associated with a lower incidence and duration of delirium. Now this is one of the examples where there seems to be a bit of a conflict. In one place we're saying there's no role for non-pharmacologic delirium prevention and yet in another one we're saying early mobilization be performed. This is because the questions were asked slightly differently by two different groups. So the bottom line is we think early mobilization is beneficial and has been associated with a reduction in incidence and duration of delirium and recommend its use. When it comes to treating delirium, there is very little evidence. More specifically, there is no published evidence that treatment with haloperidol reduces delirium. There is weak data with level C evidence that atypical antipsychotics may reduce the duration of delirium. We need to be careful using these medications in patients at risk for torsade, things like QT prolongation or other medications that may prolong the QT interval, or patients who have a history of torsade. We do not recommend using the drug rivastigmine, and we'll talk about that study. And when delirium is related to either alcohol or benzodiazepine withdrawal, we suggest using dexmedetomidine rather than benzodiazepines to reduce the duration of delirium. This is the MENS study in which patients were randomized to receive either dexmedetomidine or lorazepam. And you can see that the darker bars, the patients receiving dexmedetomidine, had a higher number of coma-free days a not quite statistically significant higher number of delirium-free days, and understanding that neither delirium nor coma are especially wonderful places for our brains to be. If you look at the incidence of or the number of days with neither delirium or coma, the dexmedetomidine group had a higher number of those days. This is data from the SEDCOM trial, a similar randomized study where patients were randomized to receive either dexmedetomidine or midazolam. You can see that at baseline, before receiving blinded study drug, the incidence of delirium was about 60% in both groups.
But very quickly after study drug was started, and remember this was blinded and the assessors for delirium did not know which drug the patients were getting, the patients who received dexmedetomidine in the dark bars had a more rapid drop in the incidence of delirium compared to those patients who were randomized to receive blinded midazolam, where the incidence of delirium stayed relatively high. This is a similar graph from the men's data that we published before. This was published in 2010 when they looked at the delirium rating similar to the way it was performed in SEDCOM. And you can see that in this method, there's a very similar result comparing dexmedetomidine and lorazepam. At baseline, the incidence of delirium was about 60%. And in patients who received lorazepam, it actually went up over the next few days compared to those who were randomized to receive dexmedetomidine, where it came down. This is data from the pivotal Schweikert study, in which patients were randomized to receive early mobilization in red, or standard of care in blue. And you can see that by about hospital 14, hospital day 14, there was very little difference in the number of patients who had attained functional independence. But look what happens beyond that. There's a dramatic separation with that group randomized to early mobilization attaining a nearly 80% incidence of functional independence compared to under 50% in the control group. So clearly, early mobilization has beneficial effects. In addition, if you look at the time of ICU delirium, either while in the ICU or later while in the hospital, it is significantly reduced in the group randomized to early mobilization. 33% versus 57% in the ICU, 28% versus 41% for the total hospital number of days. Now, it's not clear whether the beneficial effect in the reduction of delirium is due to the mobilization itself, or as this slide from a different study performed by Dale Needham and their group, perhaps the reduction is due to a different kind of sedation. You can see in this before and after study that the percent of patients who ever received benzodiazepines dropped from 96% in the before group to 73% during their early mobilization study. Similarly, if you look at the number of uh, medical ICU days with benzodiazepine use, that dropped from about 50% down to 26% of the days, and the doses of midazolam that were given were significantly less, dropping from 47 midazolam equivalents down to 15. If you look at the uh, number of days with narcotics or the number of patients who were receiving narcotics, you can see there's a reduction. Similarly, the doses morphine equivalent were reduced. And most impressively, if you look at the percent of days that patients had deep sedation, a RAS of minus 4 or minus 5, that was 43% of the days in the before study compared to only 18% afterward. And the percent of time that patients spent alert with a RAS of minus 1 to plus 1 went from 30% to 67%. So dramatic differences in the kind of sedation that were provided, the frequency of drugs and the doses used, this translated into a reduction in days spent delirious. Now this study was a very interesting one in which patients were randomized to receive either Haldol, Ziprazidone, or placebo. And you can see that if you look at delirium or coma-free days, delirium days, coma days, ventilator-free days, length of stay, mortality, no difference. And it's not clear with this small pilot study why that might be. 
if you look at how often patients had coma on the first day, that seemed to be around 30 to 40 percent in all groups. And similarly, the incidence of delirium on the first day was around 50 percent in all three groups. So it's not clear if this was a prevention study or a treatment study, but it did not appear to have a very dramatic effect. Now there's a larger version of this study being performed now, and we look with eagerness for those results. There is data that has been performed uh, looking at olanzapine versus haloperidol for treating delirium. This was performed in 73 patients in medical and surgical ICUs who were randomized to receive either haloperidol, 2.5 to 5 milligram doses every 8 hours, or oral olanzapine, 5 milligrams once a day. Doses could be titrated up. Haloperidol and benzodiazepines were allowed. And the bottom line is that there was no difference between the two arms. There was a similar beneficial response to haloperidol and to olanzapine. This looks at the delirium score over the first five days of the study, and you can see that the solid line, patients receiving olanzapine, and the dotted line, patients receiving haloperidol, showed similar reductions in delirium scores. This is from a different study in which patients with established delirium, having received haloperidol already, were randomized to receive either quetiapine or placebo. And both arms could receive rescue haloperidol. You can see that the group that received quetiapine compared to placebo with haloperidol rescue had a much more rapid resolution of their delirium, also had less agitation, and a greater rate of leaving the hospital to go home or to rehab compared to the group that received placebo with Haldol Rescue. Now this was a small study, but I think it suggests that there may be some benefit to using quetiapine or the other atypical antipsychotics. We clearly need more data in this area. This study randomized 450 patients, primarily after non-cardiac surgery, to receive either haloperidol at 0.1 milligrams per hour for 12 hours or placebo. And when they looked at either the ICU length of stay, the incidence of delirium, or the mean time to onset of delirium, although there were statistically significant differences, Many people feel that there were not clinically significant differences. 21 hours versus 23 hours. 6.2 days versus 5.7 days. 6.8 days versus 6.7 days. Similarly, the 28-day mortality was not different between the two groups. So whether prophylactic haloperidol may be beneficial Hard to know for sure. This is a more recent study that was published this year. It was a before and after evaluation of ICU patients at high risk for delirium who were all open label treated with haloperidol in doses of 0.5 to 1 milligram every eight hours. When they compared the group treated with haloperidol to the before group, they showed a reduction in the incidence of delirium with haloperidol use at 65% compared to 75% in the before group, a higher number of delirium-free days, 20 versus 13, a lower hazard ratio for 28-day mortality adjusted for sepsis at 0.8, a lower incidence of ICU readmission, 11% compared to 18%, and a lower incidence of unplanned removal of tubes or lines, 12% versus 19%. This study was not a randomized, controlled, blinded study, but rather was an open label before and after study. As such, I think we need to look at this with some caution 
but it does provide a very provocative uh, statement that perhaps there is benefit to Haldol, and clearly additional work is needed. This was the rivastigmine study in which patients were randomized to receive either rivastigmine or placebo. And it's important to note that this study was stopped early because the rivastigmine group had lower survival and a higher incidence of delirium. We do not recommend the use of rivastigmine. Finally, this is data from the SEDCOM study. And recall that about 60% of the patients had delirium at baseline. And in those 60% of patients, those who received blinded dexmedetomidine had a much lower incidence of delirium during study drug, 68%, compared to 95% in the midazolam group. If you look at the 40% of patients who were not delirious at baseline, only a third of them who were treated with dexmedetomidine developed delirium, 32%, compared to 55% with midazolam. So it appears that if you have delirium, it goes away more quickly and maybe disappears with dexmedetomidine more often than with midazolam. And if you don't have delirium, you develop it less frequently with dexmedetomidine compared to midazolam. So to summarize, the 2013 guidelines recommend the use of the numeric rating scale either that or the BPS or the CPOT, and the use of opiates for pain. We recommend using the SAS or the RAS for sedation, and either sedation interruption or titration to a light level of sedation. We recommend the provision of analgesia first for sedation and a light target level of sedation. Non-benzodiazepine sedation with either dexmedetomidine or propofol use of the ICDSC or the CAM-ICU to monitor delirium, an early mobilization approach, and atypical antipsychotics, but not for patients with risk for torsade. Finally, if delirium is not related to withdrawal from benzos or ethanol, we recommend the use of dexmedetomidine rather than benzodiazepines. The group does not recommend using vital sign abnormalities like tachycardia or hypertension to diagnose pain, but rather to use them as a prompt that we should assess pain, and if pain is present, then treat it appropriately. We do not recommend preventive use of haloperidol or atypical antipsychotics for preventing delirium, and we do not recommend the use of rivastigmine or haloperidol to treat delirium.